Chapter 5, Bold Authority. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? The phrase gets tacked onto the end of many prayers, but I think it has about as much meaning to us as amen. Amen does not mean, that's it, I'm done now, the little period at the end of my prayer. Amen is an ancient Hebrew word that was transliterated, kept virtually intact, into New Testament Greek. It is a pronouncement, firm and authoritative. Yes, so be it. Let this be done. Amen is a declaration. In that sense, it is like a command, or it once was. Now it has the emotional force of, talk to you later, at the end of a phone call. In Jesus' name is even more of a command, far, far more declarative and final, like the drop of a judge's gavel. We are using the authority of the ruler of all galaxies and realms to enforce the power of what we have just prayed. We have been exploring the way things work in effective prayer. As we look deeper into the spiritual realm, we discover that the whole thing runs on authority. It is the secret to the kingdom of God and one of the essential secrets to prayer that works. It is the secret to the kingdom of God and one of the essential secrets to prayer that works. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Matthew 8, verses 5 to 10. I'm guessing it took something pretty remarkable to astonish Jesus. He was astonished. Did you notice what it was? The centurion understood authority. To say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they will go or come and they will come. Verse 8 to 9. Remember, there is a way things work. If you run your hand along the grain of a 2 by 4 you'll get a splinter. If you approach an elk upwind, you'll spook him. If you turn a canoe sideways in the current, you'll flip it. There is a way things work in the physical realm, and we must learn to live with it. Reality is one of the great tools of God to grow people up, and he is deeply committed to growing us all up. Don't forget that. Children learn all the hard ways, the scraped knees, the burnt fingers, Wisdom is largely cultivated on encountering the laws of the physical world and adjusting our lives to accommodate. Better still, we learn to use those laws to our advantage. We cook with that heat, we build with that lumber. The same holds true in the spiritual realm. There is a way things work. Like the children in a fairy tale, we have been thrust into a collision of kingdoms. Kingdoms are realms that are governed by a ruler, the king, and they operate on the basis of authority. Back in the story of Daniel and his three-week fast, the angel finally showed up and explained he would have been there sooner, but he was blocked by the territorial spirit that held sway over the Persian kingdom. He eventually got through, but did you notice how? He brought in a higher-ranking angel. The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come, Daniel 10, 13 to 14. The messenger got through the blockade because the mighty archangel Michael came and used his greater authority and no doubt power. That is what we are doing when we use Jesus' name. We are using his authority. A quick overview might help bring clarity. God made the earth. He then gave it to Adam and Eve along with authority to govern it. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. Psalm 115.16 The first man and woman, Lord and Lady, of this earthly kingdom, 
forfeited their authority through their disobedience. This is how Satan became the prince of the world. John 14, 30. When the evil one slithered up to Jesus in the wilderness and tried to tempt him out of the cross, he offered him the kingdoms of this world as if they were his to give. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Luke 4, 5-7. It was his offer because we turned it over to him at the fall of man. Prince of this world means ruler of this world. And he has brought ruin and devastation through his malevolent reign, as Stalin did, as Pol Pot did. When an evil ruler comes into power, it allows evil into the kingdom. A man I knew was in Washington, D.C. during the inauguration of one of the less respectable presidents of the last century. He said that he could see demons rushing into the White House from all directions. Authority had shifted to darkness. The epicenter of the Teutonic shifts I keep alluding to was the coming of Jesus of Nazareth, son of the living God, who became the son of man to win it all back. He won it all back because the abdication of the throne occurred through the sin of Adam. It could only be undone through the atonement of those sins. Through his life of total obedience to the Father, through his perfect atonement for our sins by way of his cross and death, Jesus totally disarmed Satan and all those fallen angels like the prince of the Persian kingdom. God forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it all away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Colossians 2, 13-15 God the Father, in partnership with God the Son, disarmed the powers and authorities. The Greek here for powers and authorities is arche and exousia, the exact words Paul used to refer to foul spirits of various rank. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, arche, against the authorities, Exousia, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 6.12 By the cross, our Father and Jesus caught the enemy totally off guard, undermined his claims, disarmed the authority of his stolen throne. The evil one and all his allies have lost their right to bold dominion, and that right has been given to Jesus who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 8-11 All of this, the victory, the overthrow of Satan's right to rule, the transfer of authority, power, and dominion to the Son of God. This is what Jesus was referring to after his resurrection. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, verse 18. Let that sink in. The relief of it will lift a mighty weight off your shoulders. All authority in the heavens, the spiritual realms, and all authority on this planet has been handed to Jesus Christ. Think of the redemption that can now take place because of that one fact. Yes, that is my point, you might say. I believe Jesus won, so why don't prayers work better than they do? Isn't Satan defeated? Stay with me now because this has staggering implications for you and the way you pray. The invasion of the kingdom of God is something that is still unfolding right now today. Jesus is not merely seated upon a throne somewhere up in the sky. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 21 and 24 to 25. That until gives us a very different way of understanding how Jesus is reigning at the current moment and why world events still seem so chaotic. Are all his enemies under his feet? Clearly not. The verse says not, and the evening news illustrates it. Jesus, Son of God, Lord of angel armies, is reigning until he has finished what he began. The image that comes to mind is the terrible battle for the South Pacific in World War II. Island by island, bunker by bunker, tunnel by tunnel, a bloody battle had to be waged until the enemy was thoroughly and completely rooted out. Yes, we took the beach at Iwo Jima and the airstrip. The enemy was defeated, but he still fought on. Subduing the entire island was an unspeakably savage undertaking, much as you see in the world today. Oh yes, Jesus has won, but his kingdom has obviously not fully come on this earth. Which brings us to the famous model for prayer, held high by the church down through the ages, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. We invoke the kingdom. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this today our daily bread. Matthew 6, 9-11 to Held high, repeated ritually, but rarely understood. Have you ever wondered why the Lord's Prayer begins with us praying, Your kingdom come? The man who knew best how to pray is telling us to invoke his kingdom. We are, after all, partners in this mission. And this is what he wants us to begin prayer with. The obvious implication is that his kingdom is not always come. His will is not always done on earth as it is in heaven. Or what a ridiculous thing to tell us to pray. Why would Jesus urge us to pray for something that has no meaning? He does not tell us to pray that the sun rises tomorrow. We are never urged to pray that the sun will rise again each day. God's will is going to be done every sunrise. You can rest on that one, nothing to pray about there. But you are told to invoke his kingdom from heaven to earth. Maybe he's referring to the second coming. You know, the return of Christ in his kingdom then. I think... This is actually the vague idea in most people's minds when they pray the Lord's Prayer. But the next line goes, Give us this day our daily bread. Today, the prayer is talking about today. Forgive our debts, deliver us from temptation, our current needs. They will not be needs when we are in heaven. The famous prayer is focused on this moment and our immediate needs. Apparently, our greatest need is for his kingdom to invade our lives and our worlds. Remember now, God is growing us up in the midst of war. Prayer is partnership with God. We are allies with him in the invasion of his kingdom. It makes perfect sense for Jesus to teach us to invoke his kingdom in our prayers. It makes all the sense in the world and opens up staggering opportunities for prayer. Because one of the most crippling convictions held by believers today is the idea that everything that happens is the will of God. It is a poisonous belief that will destroy your confidence in God. You will end up believing terrible things about him. The news report about a pack of teenage boys who repeatedly raped a little girl with Down syndrome. That is the will of God? Listen very carefully. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that God never causes anyone to sin. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. James 1, 13 to 16. God does not tempt, nor does he cause you to sin. But people sin every day, 
and their sins have devastating consequences. So there are all kinds of events happening every day that are not caused by God. Remember, we live in a world where God has granted to human beings and to angels the dignity of causation, the dignity of making things happen. You get to make things happen just as God does. God did not cause Adam and Eve to sin, nor did he prevent them from doing so, and their sin had staggering consequences. I simply want to point out that the divining question in any of those sovereignty of God debates is, do people make meaningful choices, yes or no? If you say yes, then not everything that happens is the will of God. If you say no, then God is the ultimate micromanager and we are all figures in his video game. He caused those boys to rape that precious little girl. He caused ISIS to execute those children. They were carrying out the will of God. Do you see how important this is? Do people make meaningful choices? Indeed, they do. The scriptures are full of provocations to choose, like when Joshua said to the people of Israel, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the God of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. What a ridiculous thing to put before them if people don't really choose. Nicholas Wolterstorff wrote a beautiful and heartbreaking book when he lost his 21-year-old son in a mountaineering accident. Lament for a Son is the recorded struggle of a father wrestling with questions like, Why doesn't God intervene? And, What kind of world do we have here? Speaking of his son and his mountaineering, Walter Storff said, Why did he climb at all? What was it about the mountains that drew him? I suspect that only those who themselves climb can really know. He was lured by the exhilaration of meeting head-on the intellectual and physical challenge of climbing. Beauty, pure from the hand of God, untouched by human hand. And deepest, perhaps, climbing was for him a spiritual experience. To us, soft, fragile, unsure-footed creatures scrambling over them, the mountains are menacingly indifferent. How insipid it would be if every misstep Every slip of the hand meant no more than a five-foot drop into an alpine meadow. The menace is essential to the exhilaration of achievement. How insipid it would be if God turned every misstep of our lives into a soft landing on marshmallows. And clearly he does not. So we are back to the idea of growing up. When our boys were young, we did choose what color socks they wore. When they were very, very young, we even dictated what they put in their mouths. But as they grew older, things changed. They were given more responsibility. One day we handed them the keys to the car. We handed over to them the potential to kill someone, to kill themselves. Maturity sets the stage for more and more meaningful choices. As William James said, Our present life feels like a fight, as if there was something really wild in the universe which we are needed to redeem. Sharing his authority which brings us around to praying in Jesus' name. We were talking about the overthrow of the kingdom of darkness and the authority given to Jesus Christ. We were following the actions of Jesus in the world today, reigning until he has finished vanquishing evil. The Lord of angel armies in all his forces, angelic and human, are now in the throes of bringing his enemies under his feet, beach by beach, tunnel by tunnel. I believe part of the reason God has left it to be done in this way is because he is growing us up. We too must learn to rule and reign. In 1 Kings 18, God intended to end the drought, but Elijah had a major role. It was up to his prayers to call down the deluge. As C.S. Lewis said, He seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly and in the twinkling of an eye. Creation seems to be delegation through and through. The delegation not only of major tasks, but also of the authority to get them done. Having cast down the usurped ruler of this world, all authority was given to Jesus. And then trumpets ought to ring and banners unfurled. 
He, in turn, gives us his majestic authority. I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Luke 10, 19. Paul was so excited about this. He prayed earnestly that God would give each of us a personal revelation in our heart of hearts on how magnificent it is. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Ephesians 1, 18-23 God placed all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be head of everything. For whom? For the church, for you and me. And then, to make it perfectly clear, our Father seats us with Christ right there in authority at his right hand. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4-6 Talk about lavish and scandalous. You have been given a share in the authority of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, Lord of the heavens and the earth. Do you wield it in prayer? Can you see that it just might make a difference if you did? Maybe we should pray like Paul and ask for a personal revelation on the truth of this. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I ask you to open the eyes of my heart and grant to me a personal revelation on the truth of the authority given to Jesus and how I really do share in that authority. Break this through to me. Oh, friends, we are so far from the pathetic cries of the orphan and slave. We are God's sons and daughters, his friends and allies, now princes and princesses in his kingdom, wielding his authority, and we get to play a dramatic role in the story. When Ananias cried out his orders and restored Saul's sight, he felt free to employ Jesus' name. He acted in the name of the king. So did Peter and John. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Acts 3, 1 to 8. Like this centurion, these guys understood authority. And look what happened when they began to exercise it. They didn't call a prayer meeting and ask God to heal the man. They did it in his name. They acted like sons of the king. Which adds a whole new dimension to understanding just who you are when you pray. You are not the orphan child sitting out in the hall hoping your busy father will see one of the notes you've pushed under his door. You are not a homeless beggar standing on the corner hoping God will pass by and hand you a couple of bucks. You are not a refugee standing in line at the embassy hoping the ambassador will hear your request. Not even a faithful servant humbly trying to do your best. You are a son or daughter of the living God, a friend and ally 
wielding his authority to get things done. And by the way, Your eternal destiny is to reign. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Daniel seven thirteen to 14 and 18. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom, prepared for you since the creation of the world. Matthew twenty five thirty four. With your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelations 5, 9 and 10. You will reign, dear ones, over glorious kingdoms and realms within the great and glorious kingdom of our Father, a role we certainly need some preparation for. In another favorite Narnia story, The Horse and His Boy, the lost prince of Archenland is returned to his father, an orphaned boy, returned to his rightful role just as we are. But he has some learning to do, some catching up to do before he can assume full responsibility. Shasta, now proclaimed prince, laments to his two horse companions, Oh, it's far worse for me than for you. I am going to be educated. I shall be learning reading and writing and heraldry and dancing and history and music while you'll be galloping and rolling on the hills of Narnia. A prince totally unaccustomed to the ways of the kingdom cannot be entrusted with the throne until he has had some preparation. We just need some educating. We really thought this life was simply about getting a nice little situation going for ourselves and living out the length of our days in happiness. I'm sorry to take that from you, but you and I shall soon be inheriting kingdoms, and we are almost illiterate when it comes to ruling. So God must prepare us to reign. How does he do this? In exactly the same way he grows us up. He puts us in situations that require us to pray and to learn how to use the authority that has been given to us. How else could it possibly happen? Now we are ready for the prayer of intervention.